Alright, good work guys. Way to set that new standard at V20. We got it. So, after a fun weekend of crushing some new climbing goals, I came back to see a bunch of requests to review Emil Abramson's new video about hangboard training two times per day for 30 days. So I was immediately curious. I clicked the link, watched the video, and was amazed at the improvements he made. In fact, I myself had to resist the initial urge of, when the heck do I start, and start sending V22. Let's see if we can figure out what's really going on here. Yeah, that's right. We're talking science. So in this video, we will talk about both the research and what likely happened to Emil and his training from a scientific and like anatomical point of view. We'll look at the good and the bad or the not so good of each. But to start, I want to make a note right away that Emil makes a great point, and in fact he makes it twice, that everyone needs to understand. You should not take any of the information as an absolute science, because we have a sample size of one. I mean, I guess two if you count his brother and his claims of improved strength as well. But this is a case study at this point. But with that aside, let's get into it and talk about the good, the bad, and the biggest question you all have, should I do this? So before we get into Emil's actual training, let's talk about what this was all based around. An article titled, Minimizing Injury and Maximizing Return to Play, Lessons from Engineered Ligaments. In this article, they develop connective tissue, or as they call it, sinew, from human fibroblast cells that were collected during ACL reconstructive surgery. They use these cells to create hundreds of sinew for their testing. One of the main results of the paper were that, Sinews, like bone, quickly become refractory to an exercise stimulus, suggesting that short, less than 10 minute periods of activity with relatively long, like six hour periods of rest, are best to train these tissues. This is the essence of what Emil based his training off of. So let's jump right into some of those claims. Tenocytes are cells that help create collagen, which is essential in our connective tissue, and the response has a period of about six hours where it will not respond to further stimulus. So yes, stimulating every six hours will improve collagen synthesis. The research also shows that the data suggests that limited range of motion exercises, even if performed with a light weight, should be effective at increasing collagen synthesis in a developing or regenerating tendon or ligament. They base this off of having similar results at two and a half and 10% stretch, basically saying that there was not a significant difference between those two groups, meaning that adding more force didn't make a significant change. So this is why Emil chose light loads rather than heavy or max weight hangs. This is also what made this safer for him to do because he wasn't constantly overloading the tissue, creating excess breakdown. But there are some problems with applying this research to a training plan. The research paper itself acknowledges one of the main limitations, in my opinion, is that it is an in vitro study. They say, that it is very difficult to understand how cells within a healthy adult tendon respond to nutrition or exercise. This is important to understand because while this may be as close as we can get to reproducing tests of sinew, it is not perfect. In fact, the paper goes on to state that with the in vitro sinew, the rate of collagen synthesis is significantly higher and they are much weaker than adult sinews. So right off the bat, we have to understand that taking their research may not have a direct correlation to training we do in the real world, and there may not be a direct one-to-one -one correlation. The research article briefly outlines how they determined that frequency and intensity do not matter, but they don't go into many clear details. For example, I mentioned that Emil based the light load off of the fact that in the research they stretched the sinew at 2.5 to 10% intensities. What does that mean? If they just acknowledge that their tissue is much weaker than adult sinew, how much force is this? Also, how was it created? Was it pulled from one end like a tendon would be as the muscle initiates the pull and the bone does not, or is it being pulled from both sides? 
They mentioned this important aspect earlier in that tendons have different zones of compliance, but how did they do their actual testing? Did it mimic this? I simply would have liked more details about their methods to truly understand and apply their findings. The recommendations are also very broad and open to interpretation. The basic recommendation is that sessions should be less than 10 minutes long, performed with a light weight, and perhaps with a small range of motion with six hours between sessions. It does not dictate whether that means it needs 10 minutes of active work, rest periods, etc. This actually created some confusion in Emil's plan, which we'll talk about, but really that was not his fault because the paper doesn't outline anything specifically. Finally, the paper classified ligaments and tendons as sinew and applied their results across the board despite early on in the paper recognizing the important differences in tendons and ligaments. In fact, tendons are less prone to injury when they are more compliant, whereas this is not necessarily the case for ligaments. Climbing depends on ligaments and tendons, which makes this slightly confusing in my opinion. Okay, so the paper isn't perfect, but it can be a guide map. We can use some of this information to create our own training programs, and that's exactly what Emil did, so let's take a look at his training plan. Honestly, I thought the actual training plan was great. If they wanted to stimulate multiple tissues, they did a great job with their planning. The crimp position would be would bias the pulleys, the open hand drag would bias the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis, and the pocket training on many of the ligaments of the hand itself. The load he created also made the actual training itself quite safe. He is not progressively overloading the tissue, just the opposite. If he was progressively overloading the tissue, he wouldn't have been able to sustain the program and rather he would have likely suffered an overuse injury quickly and likely would have noticed a steep drop off in his training, not an improvement. Since the load was so light, he didn't suffer this fate and rather noticed a sharp increase in his strength. So what happened? Well, before we get into that, let's talk about what wasn't great about the training plan. So the only thing I can really say here is not actually an attack on their plan at all um, because they didn't really have anything to go off of. The research paper just states that the activity should be less than 10 minutes long. In the paper, it does specify that one load per 10 seconds was no different than one load per one second, but this is not well translated into an actual protocol. So when Emil and his brother designed their training plan, they chose a 10 second load with a 50 second rest 10 times. This produced a total work of 100 seconds, and this is clearly less than 10 minutes, so technically it still follows the what the paper is doing. I just think the paper could have outlined a clearer protocol here because it's hard to say that Emil's results follow directly along with what the paper implies because of this large dichotomy. But regardless of that, we still see some really crazy changes. Massive increase in hold times and weight across the board. So what the heck happened? What likely happened could be twofold. First, I think the frequent low load of the tissue triggered healing to his connective tissue, such as his pulleys. This would be more relatable to the research paper as the paper states they're using an ACL, which is a ligament, and our pulleys are more closely related to that than they are to the tendons of our flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. This also makes sense as most of his actual testing is in the crimp position, not the open hand position, meaning most of the stress of the testing is in the pulleys and not the aforementioned tendons of the finger flexors. If that's the case, great. It was a useful tool to help heal up his tissue. But let's explore this concept a little more. If he did use this program truly to help heal his pulleys, has he been overtraining? If he is now healing, is he pulling harder because he feels stronger or more healed? Is this ability to pull harder now triggering the adaptations that produce the final test results? It's possible, but that kind of significant change in 30 days is so dramatic, I don't know that I can say that's the only factor. Think about it. If you're not familiar with regular training, you need to know that you need to load tissue to a certain percent of its capacity in order to make a great change. If he wasn't 
climbing, training, or doing anything else, just these submax hangs, it would not have caused those changes. Let's make this even more clear with a more ridiculous example. No one would ever expect that doing a bicep curl with a two pound weight for 30 days would then allow them to miraculously lift a 60 pound one. So what else is going on? Before we can fully understand what likely happened with this training, we need to talk a bit of tendon physiology. Tendons in general fall along a spectrum of being stiff or compliant. A stiff tendon will only stretch a small amount and release more energy with more force. A compliant tendon will stretch more and release energy slowly with less force. In general, a more compliant tendon is less prone to injury because of its ability to attenuate forces and simply because it cannot create as much force. In fact, the paper itself that is referenced in Emil's video, Minimizing Injury, Maximizing Play, states that the compliant region of a tendon is believed to protect the attached muscle from injury by acting as a shock absorber. Research has also shown that tendon stiffness can be increased over just a four week period and that these quick changes are more likely related to the physical properties of the tendon, i.e. stimulation of lysol oxidase, which increases cross-linking of collagen and elastin and not actual thickening or hypertrophy of the tendon itself. Tendon thickening or hypertrophy can be seen after eight weeks of training. So with the meals program, what likely happened is the aforementioned. He likely increased his tendon stiffness with this program, which improved his ability to apply force through his fingers. This allowed him to generate greater force during all of his tests. So while this is amazing, it does have its drawbacks. It can increase risk of injury. As mentioned in those four weeks, while the physical properties of the tendon are changing and becoming stiffer and generating more force, the thickness is not changing. So not only is the compliance of the tendon reducing, but he is also able to handle more force on the tendon without an actual thickening of the tendon. Now, this is not all bad news. It just needs to be employed properly within a training period. Have you ever done exercises like where your therapist made you hold the position for 30 seconds or so? I know I make my patients do it from time to time and the purpose is clear. First, it creates a lot of awareness. You know and understand the force, strain, and stress you're placing on your body. Second, and more importantly, a longer submaximal hold will improve compliance of the tendons and help heal them. You can then change your training to work on strength training with short max holds. This will stiffen the tendon while improving muscular strength, while training the proper energy system for your sport, and improving awareness of the central nervous system to understand the holds it can safely tolerate. In short, the program that Emil used, if slightly modified, can be a great tool for improving the health of a tendon to prepare for a training block that will get you ready for a performance season. Essentially, many of you who first watch Emil's video and are now watching this one are introduced to a concept in the training world known as periodization or block training. It is a system used to increase the performance by cycling different aspects based upon your goals. For example, in the off season when maximum performance is not the goal, using sub-maximal holds for 30 seconds can help healing and repair of tissue. Then as the season gets closer and you want to focus on performance, you can change your program to focus on more strength training to stiffen the tissue, improve muscular strength, and make central nervous system changes that will get you ready to perform. Periodized or block training is a key to success for many athletes, and if you're looking to take your training to the next level, this is one way to do so. Conclusion, training for climbing is a serious endeavor. 
We all want to improve and progress can be slow, but that doesn't stop us from learning more about how to improve your training. That doesn't stop us from exploring new techniques to crush our next grade. Hopefully this video helps to elucidate a few things. One, research creates new opportunities for growth, but it has its limitations. Two, case studies are great examples of what can be, but are not the law. They are not the rule of thumb and may not work for everyone. Three, periodization or block training can really amplify your training, but you need to be strategic with how you do it and understand the cost and benefits each phase has. Four, educating yourself on advanced topics can be challenging, but there are so many resources out there. You just have to look. That way you can train in a smart, efficient manner that is safe and effective for you. You can climb your butt off and always you can send your projects and then you can repeat them. The research article briefly outlines how they determined the frequency and intensity. This is also makes more sense I need some water. My mouth is getting dry. As we started that, I was like, I might need water. No, it's fine. And then I'm like licking my lips to talk. Maybe I should like have my climbing backpack on and like take it off. It's the corniest end to ever. I'm just gonna like walk in and like, should I say bye to my invisible friends? <laughs> See you guys. All right, good work guys. Way to set that new standard at V20. When the heck do I start and send V18, even though we were just doing V20? Darn it. Dude, say something cool so they like the videos and subscribe for more awesome content. Um, like and subscribe for more super sweet vids, y'all. <sighs> so lame, dude. So lame. I thought it was pretty good.